Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to be here in Silwyn. Thank you for those uh, comments. When Ian McFarlane delivered the inaugural lecture in this series in 2002, he said, and I quote, any objective assessment of achievements would place Sir Leslie among the most distinguished Australians of the past century. So for me, it's a great personal privilege to be able to honour his uh, contribution to the economics profession uh, today, and it's a particular privilege to be able to do it under the mural here. This mural was previously in the bank's office in uh, Melbourne. We sold that building last year and we were looking for a home for this uh, mural. And we couldn't have thought of a better place in the world for it to end up here at ANU where um, Nugget Coombs had a very strong affinity with. So thank you for taking our mural and it's a, it's a particular honour to be able to speak underneath it. Leslie Melville, as Selwyn said, had a long and close association with the Reserve Bank of Australia. He was a member of the Reserve Bank Board for most of the time between 1960 and 1975. And before joining the board, he played a critical role in the debates that shaped the mandate given to the Reserve Bank in 1959. It's now six decades since that mandate was passed by Parliament, and it's more than stood the test of time. So from this perspective alone, I think we have a lot to thank Sir Leslie for. In today's lecture, I'd like to discuss two issues that Melville had strong opinions on. The first is the appropriate objectives of the central bank, and the second is his view regarding the impossibility of zero interest rates. Both of these issues have echoes in today's discussions of monetary policy. So first, central bank objectives. Over recent decades, there's been much discussion in the academic and policy communities as to whether the central bank should have a single mandate, that's price stability, or a dual mandate, price stability and full employment. And in practice, we see examples of both around the world. Here in Australia, though, the Reserve Bank of Australia has neither a single nor a dual mandate. We have a triple mandate, which I have up here. Under the legislation passed in 1959, it's the duty of the Reserve Bank Board to ensure that its policies are directed to the greatest advantage of the people of Australia uh, so that uh, we contribute to the stability of the currency of Australia, the maintenance of full employment in Australia and the economic prosperity and welfare of the people of Australia. This triple mandate was taken from earlier legislation passed in 1945 that set the objectives for the Central Bank Division of the Commonwealth Bank. This legislation had its origins in a post-World War II Australia when ensuring economic stability and high levels of employment were very much top of mind. Establishing such a broad mandate for the central bank ran against the conventional wisdom of the time, which was that central banking was just about currency and banking. Indeed, in his book on the history of the Reserve Bank, Boris Shedvin was moved to write, and here I quote him, this bold declaration of responsibility was a landmark in the history of central banking. It was a landmark in the sense that the Australian Parliament recognised that central banking was not just about money and finance, but it was also about jobs and the welfare of our society. And as the current Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, I very much share this perspective. Ultimately, central banking is not only about finance and money, Rather, it's about enhancing the economic welfare of the people we serve, primarily through achieving price and financial stability and maximum sustainable employment. Melville had a very important hand in setting this direction for the institution that I now lead. His contribution goes back to at least 1936, when he made a lengthy submission to the Royal Commission on the Monetary and Banking Systems in Australia. As you can see here, the first sentence of that submission reads, the ultimate purpose of monetary policy is to enable the economic system to achieve the optimum use of available resources as far as is possible. It was then 23 years later that this idea, in slightly different words, found expression in the Reserve Bank Act 1959. It's worth recalling though that Melville had less success in his quest for full employment to be incorporated into the charters of the global economic institutions that were set up after World War II. As Selwyn says, he was frequent, a frequent uh, visitor to, to Washington in the United States to set up these institutions. 
and he was a strong advocate for what became known as the full employment approach. He wasn't able to convince the international organisations, but his commitment to full employment was an enduring uh, uh, nature, uh, enduring aspect of his, uh, his advocacy. But back um, to the world of central banking, since the early 1990s, the conventional wisdom has been that the best contribution that a central bank can make to full employment and economic welfare is to maintain low and stable inflation. This is because by keeping inflation under control and within a narrow range, the central bank can reduce uncertainty and economic distortions, and in so doing, provide a stable foundation for people to make their decisions. In turn, this provides the basis for reaching the maximum sustainable level of employment that's, that is achievable given the choices that society makes about things such as the safety net, the nature of employment arrangements and training and education. After the high inflation of the 1970s and 1980s, many central banks adopted an inflation target as the means to deliver the sought after low and stable inflation. Central banking in many parts of the world became all about inflation control and adopting an inflation target became the way of delivering that control. As part of this shift, central banks also changed their communication to focus very much on inflation outcomes. Accountability mechanisms were also developed to make sure that the central bank kept its focus squarely on inflation. This approach made a lot of sense and it worked. As you can see in this chart, inflation rates have been lower and more stable since the adoption of inflation targeting. Central banks have established strong anti-inflation credentials and expectations of high inflation have largely been wrung out of the system. Core inflation in the advanced economies has consistently been around 1% to 2% for the past 20 years and measures of inflation expectations suggest that inflation is expected to remain low for many years to come. Despite this success, things have not exactly worked out as hoped and recent experience is causing some rethinking of as some aspects of the conventional wisdom. And I'd like to draw your attention to two aspects of recent experience. The first is that low and stable inflation is not a sufficient condition for financial stability and thus ultimately full employment. Indeed, it's possible in some circumstances a low and stable inflation environment provides fertile ground for the emergence of financial stability risks. And as we've seen too often, the crystallisation of these financial stability risks can have very large welfare consequences with people losing their jobs, their incomes and their savings. So just achieving low and stable inflation is not enough to maximise economic welfare. The second aspect that I'd like to draw your attention to is that there is more uncertainty than there previously was about what is required to deliver short-run inflation control. This partly reflects some powerful global forces, including technology and increased competition from globalisation. These forces are affecting inflation dynamics almost everywhere. So it is more difficult to manage inflation tightly than it once was. In my view, the Australian approach to inflation targeting, together with our broad mandate, are better suited to this changing world than on more, more rigid monetary policy arrangements. In Australia, since the early 1990s, we've had a flexible inflation target. Our target is to achieve an average rate of inflation over time of between 2 and 3 per cent. This means that there is an acceptable degree of variation in inflation from year to year, and we've been prepared to use this flexibility. Our focus is very much on the medium term, hence on average and over time. The board is seeking to provide a strong nominal anchor that people can rely on when making their decisions. Most people in our society can cope with small variations in inflation from year to year, but dealing with medium-term uncertainty is much more difficult. Importantly, we've also always seen the inflation target as nested within the broader objective of welfare maximisation. This means that the question the Reserve Bank Board asks itself at every meeting when making interest rate decisions is how those decisions can best contribute to the welfare of the Australian people. In particular, we are seeking to achieve the maximum sustainable rate of employment consistent with inflation being a target. And we are seeking to do this in a way that limits the build-up of financial imbalances that can be the source of instability down the track. 
And in doing this, we can make a material contribution to the welfare of the society we serve. I acknowledge that there is an element of judgment and discretion in this approach. Certainly, there's more judgment involved in an approach to monetary policy that mechanically sets interest rates so that the forecast inflation rate is at the target in two years or three years' time. My view is that our more flexible approach has served Australia well, and it can more easily accommodate the changes that are taking place in the economic system than can other approaches to monetary policy. More generally, I also see longer-term benefits in terms of the standing of the central bank in the community if we explain our decisions not just in terms of inflation, but in terms of jobs and incomes. That's not to say that inflation outcomes un are unimportant, because clearly they are. Rather, we need to remember that inflation control is a means to an end, and that end is the maximisation of the welfare of the society. And I suspect that's a sentiment that Melville would have very much agreed with. I want to emphasise that the discretion we have and our broad mandate to promote the economic welfare of the Australian people do not constitute a licence for the Reserve Bank Board to pursue or advocate economic policies outside our area of expertise. Our focus is inflation control, the labour market, the payment system and financial stability. And dealing with these matters is our contribution to economic welfare. I also want to emphasise that the flexibility of our inflation target and our broad mandate and the discretion that allows us requires a very high level of transparency and accountability from us. When we make decisions, there is always an element of judgment and we do have to wrestle with some difficult trade-offs where reasonable people can come to different judgments. This means that you should expect us to explain our decisions very clearly. You should also expect us to explain the various trade-offs we face and how we're balancing those trade-offs. And as these trade-offs become more complicated in today's world of very low interest rates, you should expect us to be clear, as clear as we can about how we're viewing these trade-offs and how they're affecting our decisions. So that brings me to my second topic, and that's the very low level of interest rates around the world. Reading through Melville's various writings, it's pretty clear that he would have been very perplexed about the current state of affairs, in particular the prevalence of zero and negative interest rates. Writing in the economic record in 1938, Melville said, zero interest is a limiting but unattainable value analogous to infinity. He went on to argue that the notion that a zero rate of interest is possible assumes that there is a practical limit to the amount of useful material which can be profitably employed by society. To reinforce this point, he went on to write that at zero interest rates, and here I quote, roads would be levelled and straightened regardless of cost. In some places, mountains would be dug away and valleys filled to provide residential and agricultural land. Deserts would be watered. Beaches would be built in places accessible to cities and provided with artificial sea and sunlight. I've been a strong advocate for infrastructure investment, but I think some of these ideas uh, stretch the imagination. I found it surprising uh, to read this not just because of the obvious engineering problems involved in some of these uh, proposals, but because in other writings, Melville was very sceptical about public works and public debt. Understandably, he wanted public money to be spent wisely. So his writings in this area were quite a contrast. But it reflected his strong view that zero interest rates were an impossibility, because at zero interest rates, People would just borrow, invest and consume and satisfy all their wants. So as I said, he'd be perplexed about the current state of affairs. As things currently stand, the entire Swiss government nominal bond yield curve is in negative ter territory, and you can see that in this chart. Most of the German, Dutch, French and Japanese yield curves are also in negative territory. The Swiss government, for example, can borrow for 30 years at an interest rate of minus 0.21 per cent. 
If it were to issue a zero coupon security at this yield, it would mean that the buyer of the security would give the Swiss government 100 Swiss francs today and receive back just 100 Swiss francs in 30 years with no other payments over that 30 year period. It's remarkable. There have certainly been other periods in history where real bond yields have been negative, but such widespread negative nominal yields is unprecedented and I think it's remarkable. But it's not just governments that can borrow at negative yields. Over recent times, private companies including Coca-Cola, Orange and Siemens have issued unsecured bonds with zero coupons and have negative yields. It's also become common for European banks to issue covered bonds with negative yields. And in Denmark, at least one bank has offered residential mortgages at a negative interest rate, minus half a percent. Although after fees, the effective interest rate is just in positive territory. As you can see in this um, next chart, there are now around US $14 trillion of bonds trading at negative yields around the world. Remarkable. And around a quarter of all government bonds on issue globally are now trading at negative yields. Back in 1938, Melville would have struggled to understand this. And today in 2019, many people also wonder how things could have come to this. In a moment, I will offer a few explanations. Before I do so, I want to point out that even back in 1938, Melville's views about zero interest rates were contested. Following his article in the Economic Record, Brian Redaway and Richard Downing published a conflicting view with arguments that still have resonance today. They pointed out that even at zero interest rates, there is a limit to borrowing by both individuals and governments. And that's because even if the interest rate is zero, the principal does need to be repaid one day. This means that projects undertaken with borrowed money still need to generate a return that's sufficient to repay the principal and also to compensate for the risk. And I suspect that some of Melville's engineering ideas that I spoke about before wouldn't have met this test. So how do we explain the very low level of interest rates right around the world. Like many questions in economics, a reasonable place to start is supply and demand. Over recent times, the global supply of savings has been high relative to the demand to use those savings to invest in new productive capital. As a result, the returns to savers, especially people saving in low-risk assets, is low. There's a lot of savings out there and not much demand for use the savings, so the savers get low returns. So the question is then, why is the global appetite to save high relative to the appetite to use those savings to invest in new productive capital? I want to start with the saving side and then go through the investment side. On the saving side, I'll focus on three issues. These are demographic trends, the integration of Asia into the global economy and the legacy of high levels of borrowing in the past. So first, demographic trends. As you can see, globally there are some very large shifts taking place. In particular, population in many countries is ageing rapidly and life expectancy is continuing to increase. After rising for many decades, the share of the global population that's aged between 15 and 64 is now declining, and this decline is expected to continue. The United Nations estimates that average life expectancy has increased from just 55 years in 1970 to over 70 years now, and this trend too is expected to increase. While retirement ages have also increased as people live longer, the increase in retirement age has been less than the increase in life expectancy. So people are having to plan for more years in retirement and they're having to save more to finance those extra years in retirement. A second important factor influ influencing global savings outcomes is the rise of Asia. Asian countries now account for around one third of global GDP, up from just 10% in the early 1980s. People in Asia tend, on average, to save a fairly high share of their incomes. This partly reflects the less extensive social safety net and the nature of the financial systems in Asia. 
as incomes have risen in Asia, average saving rates in the region have fallen a little, but they remain higher than in most other parts of the world. A third factor affecting savings outcomes in many countries is the higher level of borrowing in previous years. While the experience differs across countries, at the global level, the stock of debt outstanding relative to GDP has steadily increased for the past 50 years, and it's now at a record high. The big shift has been in private debt, particularly in the advanced economies, but public debt has also trended higher over recent decades after declining following World War II. One consequence of the high level of debt is that people are more careful with their spending and they're less inclined to take on yet more debt. This is especially so when income growth is disappointed as it has over recent times. In a number of countries, both government and households feel constrained by their previous decisions to borrow and they're seeking to put their balance sheets on a sounder footing. And one way they're doing this is by spending less and saving more. So these are the, some of the factors that are having major influences on global saving outcomes. I now turn to the investment side of the equation. This is important because you might recall that Melville argued that at zero interest rates there would be an almost unlimited number of things to invest in. Today's reality though is somewhat different. Here again I'm going to point to three interrelated factors. The first is the high level of uncertainty, the second is slower population growth, and the third is some pessimism about future productivity growth. It's well understood that there has been a high level of global economic policy uncertainty over recent times, and this is evident in measures of policy uncertainty calculated from news stories in leading media outlets around the world. You can see that here. The sources of this uncertainty are well known. The long list includes the trade and technology disputes between China and the United States, the Brexit issue, the ongoing tensions in the Middle East, the problems in Hong Kong and tensions between Japan and South Korea. Not surprisingly, these events are making businesses nervous and they're responding by putting off investment decisions. Many would prefer to wait while some of the uncertainties are resolved before proceeding with costly investments. It's understandable. But as important as these geopolitical tensions are, they're not the full story. Businesses face a range of other significant uncertainties at the moment, including from the rapid pace of technology change, increased competition as a result of globalisation, and ongoing changes to regulatory arrangements. It's probable that the uncertainties generated by these structural changes are interacting and being amplified by the geopolitical issues. In this context, it's worth noting that despite uh, the marked decline in interest rates, Average hurdle rates of return for new investments in physical capital in many countries have not changed that much. It seems like there is a global norm for hurdle rates somewhere between 13 and 14 per cent, and it's hard to shift that norm, even at record low interest rates. There are a couple of possible explanations for this. The first is the reduction in the cost of borrowing has been to offset the rise in the required risk premium due to the uncertainties that I spoke about. If this were so, the hurdle rate would be unchanged. Lower normal interest rates would just be compensating for the higher risk premium, leaving the hurdle rate unchanged. The second possibility is that some firms have been slow to adjust to the new reality of low interest rates. We hear reports the hurdle rate of return of 13 to 14% has been hardwired into the corporate cultures in some companies. And changing this hard wiring is difficult and it's time consuming. However, from our liaison with Australian companies, we do know that some firms have lowered the hurdle rates of return and this is opening up new opportunities for them. And it would be good to hear more such reports over time. My view that is that there's an element of truth to both of these explanations. Risk premiums have clearly risen and in some cases, hurdle rates of return are too sticky and it would be good to see them come down. A second explanation for the lower level of investment globally is a slower rate of population growth, especially in the advanced economies. In the late 1960s, population growth in the advanced economies was running at around 1.2% a year. Since then, as you can see, it's steadily declined and it's now running at just 0.4 of 
and a number of countries in North Asia and in Europe have declining populations and other countries are forecast to join this group fairly soon. Slower population growth means there's less need to add to the capital stock to accommodate more people. Less home building and other buildings required and there's less need to invest in infrastructure to meet the needs of a growing population. While there are some specific areas where more investment might be needed, the overall effect of lower population growth is to reduce investment. A third explanation for lower investment demand is that people are less optimistic about future economic growth. The slower population growth is part of the story here, but it's not the full story. There's less optimism about future productivity growth as well. One way of seeing this is in, shift, in the shift in estimates of potential growth in the advanced economies. In the mid-1980s, estimates of potential growth were clustered around 3%, as you can see. They're now clustered around half of this. Similarly, there's been a downward shift in estimates of potential growth in Asia, especially in China and South Korea. With economies expected to grow less quickly than in the past, there's less incentive to invest. So these are the, some of the main factors that are influencing saving and investment globally. And in my view, they largely explain why we have such low global interest rates. But it's not the full story. Central banks are also playing a role. While our regular explanations of interest rate decisions typically don't reference the broader structural factors that I've just spoken about, these structural factors are having a powerful influence on the setting of interest rates right around the world. In addition, central banks have responded to the cyclical position by lowering interest rates and by buying very large quantities of government and long-term securities. Before the financial crisis, the central banks around the world held only around 5% of government debt on issue. Today, they hold nearly 30%. In Japan, the Bank of Japan holds almost 50% of government securities on issue, with these holdings equivalent to 80% of Japanese GDP. Again, remarkable. Another significant purchaser of government securities over recent times has been pension funds, particularly in Europe. As prudential regulation has been strengthened, the funds have purchased additional long-dated assets to maturity match their long-dated pension liabilities. One way of seeing the effects of these various purchases by central banks and pension funds is in the term premium. Normally, when an investor purchases a 10-year security, a risk premium is earned over and above the return that would be earned by rolling a short-term investment over the 10 years. This premium has historically averaged around 1.5%, but it's now negative. At minus 1%, you get less for buying a long-dated asset than that you expect to earn from rolling a short-dated one. Again, remarkable. It's directly related to the purchase of government securities by central banks and by others. So this is an important part of the story too, but the main story is the structural factors that I spoke about. Taking into account all these factors, the key to a return to more normal interest rates globally is to improve the investment climate. While Melville turned out to be wrong about zero interest rates, he was right in another sense. At low interest rates, many investments that didn't make sense at higher, higher interest rates now make sense. This is especially so for investments with long-term payoffs because future returns no longer need to be discounted as highly. This means that low interest rates give us the opportunity to lengthen our horizons and think about projects with really long-term payoffs. There are two central elements in improving the business investment climate. The first is a reduction in some of the geopolitical and other risks that I talk about that have led to higher risk premiums. The second is structural measures that give people confidence about future economic growth so that businesses are prepared to expand, invest and innovate. Both of these elements are largely beyond the control of central banks. They're matters for government and for business. So this is the environment in which the Reserve Bank Board is setting interest rates. It's a complicated environment. We can't ignore these global trends in saving and investment and the responses of other central banks. If we did seek to ignore these trends, the exchange rate would most likely appreciate, and the current environment that would be unhelpful in terms of both jobs growth and achieving the inflation target. 
It's important to point out, though, that while we need to take account of these global forces, there is no automatic or mechanical link between what's happening elsewhere in the world and their own monetary policy. At each meeting of the Reserve Bank Board, we're asking ourselves what is best for the Australian economy and for the welfare of the Australian people. Over the course of this year, as you know, we've lowered interest rates three times to a record low of three quarters of 1%. We're confident that these reductions are helping the Australian economy and supporting a gentle turning point in economic growth. In doing so, low interest rates are supporting jobs and overall income growth. At the same time, though, we recognise that monetary policy is not working in exactly the same way that it used to. We also recognise that low interest rates hurt the finances of many people, particularly those relying on interest income. So there's a balancing act here. The board is prepared to ease monetary policy further if needed. Having said that, it's extraordinarily unlikely that we will see negative interest rates in Australia. It is likely, though, that we will require an extended period of low interest rates to reach full employment and for inflation to be consistent with the target. As is the case internationally, though, the focus needs to be on an improvement in the investment environment so that investors are prepared to take Melville's cue and use low funding costs to build new productive assets. Not only would this help with a return to more normal interest rates, but it would also be good for our collective welfare too. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks very much for that uh, very comprehensive and uh, compelling uh, lecture. I'm sure there will be a number of uh, questions. We do have uh, limited time, so could I ask you to uh, keep the length of your questions uh, down to a minimum so we can maximise the, the number of questions asked? Um, there are microphones um, on, on uh, uh, both aisles, um, and uh, could you uh, raise your hands if you have a, have a question? So there's one. Well, there are a few issues there. I, 
Today I was trying to steer clear of any signals about um, interest rates in the short term and trying to provide some perspective about the longer term uh, factors that are really driving interest rate decisions around the world. And I think it's important that we keep those longer term factors uh, uh, in mind. As I said in my prepared remarks, the board is prepared to cut interest rates if we think it's in the collective welfare of Australia and we'll have to make that judgement, as I said, every single meeting. And we'll have another meeting next week where we have a, a discussion. On housing prices, I think it's undeniable that uh, that's part of the transmission of monetary policy. Lower interest rates do push up asset prices, and higher asset prices are supposed to encourage more investment, and uh, there's a wealth effect and people spend a bit more. So uh, that is part of the transmission mechanism. Uh, is it a problem? I don't think so. Could it become a problem? Uh, I think only if um, housing credit growth were to pick up a lot. Now, at the moment, credit growth is modest. Investor credit growth is still negative, so the outstanding credit owed by investors is still declining, and uh, credit growth to own occupiers is, un is only modest. So that's our um, main, main uh, focus, is on what's going on with credit growth, not, not with what's going on the asset prices per se. Marcus. My name is Marcus Bruckner. I'm a professor in the Research Institute of Economics and Well, I think that's true, but um, at least if you take the market's view, the markets are saying interest rates are going to stay low for a long period of time, and that's why in Europe, 10-year uh, interest rates are negative, and the, um, the forward yield curve is negative for, kind of for a very long period of time. And I think it's quite possible that's the world we end up living in, where interest rates globally are going to be very low for a long period of time. Because the, sa the things that are driving global savings are not going to go away quickly. And unless there's a revitalisation of investment around the world, there's going to be this elevated appetite to save and not much desire to invest. So I think we're in for a protracted period of very low nominal interest rates. And we've got to change the saving investment uh, balance to change that. Uh, do interest rates affect investment? In the short run, I agree with you, they don't have very much effect. But uh, lower interest rates through giving people more money to spend and in, in a small open economy by affecting the exchange rate should increase aggregate demand and when aggregate demand picks up, firms need to invest more. So there's an indirect channel. But I also think there's an, another uh, uh, important channel and that's through lowering the hurdle rates of return. If you can invest and finance that investment lower interest rates, that makes investments possible that were not feasible at higher interest rates. And as I said in my remarks, you're seeing country after country, business is still requiring 13 to 14% return on new physical capital. And the reason we have uh, low growth and uh, low interest rates is because those returns are not achievable in the world we live in. And many businesses, I think, need to make an adjustment to lower hurdle rates of return to go with the lower interest rates. And that would help as well. You know, I, I don't have a time series on um, uh, the kind of the normal percentage of people who cut their interest, uh, they cut their payments when interest rates go down. I think many people, <coughs> excuse me, many people have borrowed a lot of money, and their income growth is slow. So it's not surprising when interest rates come down that they try and pay off the debt because the real value of their debt is not being eroded as quickly as it previously was because their wages are not rising as quickly, so they're having to make more of an effort to pay off um, the mortgages. 
Not everyone's in that case, but there are, seem to be a lot of people that are. In the end, though, I, I don't think it affects the effectiveness of monetary policy. It m may mean that the effect is a bit delayed, but if people pay off their mortgages a bit, a bit more quickly, their balance sheets gets to a position they're comfortable with more quickly than they otherwise would have, and then they start spending. So I think it's quite possible that it delays the transmission of monetary policy. I think you people at ANU no doubt teach um, long and variable lags. And this is one of the reasons they teach long and variable lags, because this adjustment can take, uh, take longer or, or shorter in various episodes, and we're probably in an episode where it's taking a bit longer. But I still think it works. It's just long and variable. In terms of kind of global aggregate saving, I think it's no doubt has uh, had an impact on people's saving decisions and the f income distribution. Really, it's kind of moved up and down. Inequality's moved up and down, but in recent times, it hasn't really changed dramatically. So I don't think you can argue um, that a big change in income distribution is driving saving outcomes in Australia. Uh, What's more important is people are having to get used to slow growth in their nominal wages. We used to get, you know, in Australia people used to have wage rises of three and a half or four percent a year. That was the norm. Now the norm for many people is two or two and a half. And numbers staying with three, kind of not many people can aspire to at the moment. And as that's gone on year after year after year, people are having to adjust down their expectations of their permanent income. And that's offending, aff affecting their saving and investment decisions. I think that's a much more important thing rather than the distribution of income. It's we're all having to get used to our wages growing up, going up, starting with a two. Which, as I've said on other occasions, I think at ANU, I think that's too low because the inflation consistent rate of wage growth in Australia is close to three or three and a half. We want to deliver you an average rate of inflation of two and a half percent. And I hope we get at least 1% labour productivity growth and workers get their normal share of that. So two and a half plus one is three and a half. And that's the inflation consistent rate of uh, wage growth. At the moment we're at two, or two and a bit. So I think that's the much bigger issue than income inequality. Question up the back and then one to that. I'm a policy professor and a postgraduate student here at the uh, NIU. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts were on uh, Stanford Fisher's research Just to make sure I've got the paper in mind, it's the one that was co-authored by Stan Fisher and Philip Hildebrand, yes, and yeah, yes. yeah. And I was, I've read that very carefully. I think it's uh, it's very interesting. Really, uh, boils down. I think what they're arguing is is really boils down to its fiscal policy's job. 
because at some point that monetary policy can't stimulate the economy anymore and they say, well, the fiscal authority can keep spending and it can be financed by the central bank at relatively low cost. Uh, so really they're arguing for more activist fiscal policy and there's a debate kind of in this country about whether that would be appropriate as well. I don't want to comment on it tonight. Uh, you know, the, the, there's a deeper question they raise kind of in some circumstances, is there a case for coordinated monetary and fiscal policy to stimulate the economy? And at least conceptually, uh, you could, I can think of circumstances where that would be appropriate. I mean, if the economy were in a very difficult place with a, a sharp rise in unemployment and uh, little standard monetary policy options available, I could see there would be, in principle, circumstances uh, where coordinated and fiscal and monetary policy would help. Uh, we're a long way from those circumstances in Australia, so it's really an issue of how much extra fiscal policy support we should get, and different people are going to have different views on that here. Well, we'd all like to see more competition, wouldn't we? Um, probably just a, a few facts are helpful here. Uh, we've lowered the cash rate by 75 basis points. The standard variable mortgage rate has come down by 60. So 60 out of the 75 has been directly passed through. But what's happening every single day out there, and I encourage everyone in this room who's got a mortgage to be part of this, is people are going to the banks and asking for a better deal. And uh, many people are actually getting better deals. So the average mortgage rate has come down an extra five basis points uh, in the last three months just because people are going and shopping and knocking on the door and say, if you don't give me a better deal, I'm going to go to another bank. So we're seeing people switching all the time. And at the moment, the new rate on, the average rate on new mortgages is 30 basis points, 0.3% below the average rate on outstanding mortgages. So if you're prepared to shop around, they're actually good deals. And so there is actually competition there. It's occurring for the new borrowers um, or the people who are prepared to switch. The people who are just prepared to stay with the same old bank all the time and not knock on the door are paying higher rates than they should. And I encourage them to go and knock on the door. The best thing we can do for competition is for the people in this room and every other room around the country, if they're, not unha if they're unhappy with their mortgage rate, to go and ask for a better one, then the banks will have to respond. Well, I, I don't really have a very good answer to that. Credit card interest rates are notoriously sticky. They don't move very much at all. Uh, I think the way that we get you know, more competition here is actually people go and force the banks to compete by complaining and switching. But well, you know, I, sorry, I didn't hear that. In, in, I mean, credit card uh, interest rates are sticky right around the world. They don't move very much. Um, and there are kind of particular dynamics of the credit card market that kind of can lead to that outcome. But yeah, I, don't, I don't really have a good answer to that. I'm sorry. Well, how, how can we foster confidence? Uh, I think by being transparent about the challenges we face and uh, being, uh, you know, acting consistent with our mandate and explaining to people what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're balancing the trade-offs. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the kind of incomplete pass-through 
and remember I just said 60 of the 75 has been passed through and if you take account of all the extra switching that's going on all the time, there's another five basis points, so that's 65. And if you take my advice and go and ask for a better deal, I expect that over the next few months we'll see another five basis points. So, you know, so I could imagine 70 of the 75 will in the end be passed through, which you might say we should have 75. But, you know, 70 out of 75 is, uh, from my perspective, it's, it's reasonable. We also need to remember that monetary transmission isn't just about the mortgage rate. It gets a lot of media coverage and the politicians are obviously very interested in what happens to the mortgage rate. But that's only one interest rate in the economy. The rates that uh, most businesses pay come move with the cash rate and uh, people who are investing in Australian dollar securities and making national transfers aren't really worried about the mortgage rate. They're worried about uh, wholesale rates and, and the Reserve Bank's cash rate. So there's full kind of transmission in, on those channels. So, I think, broadly speaking, the transmission is, um, is working reasonably well. As I said in response to the other question, the, the lags are long and variable. And uh, there's a, a one up the back, and I think we'd better make this one the last. Oh, um, I'm happy to take, depending on your time, I'm happy to, yeah, it's really up to you, I'm happy to take a few more. Okay, well, it's uh, a, yeah. two or three more then. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. One of the places that's fertile ground for uh, financial stability is, can you just flush out those risks? Well, in principle, uh, as I said in response to Rory's question, I mean, lower interest rates can put, push up uh, asset prices. And uh, we know in asset markets that the rising prices can take on a life of their own and we get kind of uh, bubbles developing. I, I don't see a very high probability of that at the moment. Um, housing prices are going up, um, but I don't see it particularly problematic. You could have a financial stability risk emerge if people started borrowing a lot again. If our incomes are only growing at 2% on average you know, per person a year, but borrowing starts rising much faster than that, I think we build up future vulnerabilities, um, which, which could be difficult. Uh, in Europe, there's a lot of concern about the effect of negative and low interest rates on the profitability of the banking sectors. Banks used to welcome having, a, in Europe, they used to welcome having a lot of deposits on the balance sheet rather than having to go to wholesale funding because deposits were cheaper than wholesale funding. But it's turning out now in Europe that deposits are an expensive form of funding because the deposit rate gets bounded at zero. So banks are issuing uh, securities in the wholesale market at negative interest rates and deposits have to pay zero. So deposits are becoming a, a um, costly form of funding. So deposits are kind of becoming a liability now, which is kind of an unusual um, and kind of an, a state of the world and kind of a, it's, Things have tipped on their head. So that's causing stresses in the banking systems in Europe, particularly for banks that are largely deposit funding. Another issue that's um, arising in Europe is uh, people are concerned about the, uh, many, many, many citizens are concerned about the sustainability of their pension arrangements. In some countries with pension funds earning negative returns, nominal pensions are having to be cut and people, the citizens are worrying that their pension might be cut and so they're having to save more again. So the effect of negative interest rates is, um, is it's complicated and uh, pernicious in many ways. So this is one reason I say it's extraordinarily unlikely we'll have uh, negative interest rates in Australia. I think the evidence is mixed on whether it's been a success elsewhere. Uh, a question here and then, and then that'll be the last one, I think. And uh, you made reference to one of your predecessors uh, in Parliament, uh, and he was one of a number of economists who questioned the, the merits of any further interest rate cuts, and he did that quite recently. In addition, David Bassman, which is writing in the Penrith Review, said he took to see unemployment rate any further, any higher than it is now. He went on to say that he was part of a small, though increasing number of analysts. Uh, well, I don't really want to run commentary on people who are commenting on me. Um, <laughs> well, I think what, what, what I can say, I, I feel confident the reductions in interest rates uh, that we've had so far have, have made a positive effect. If we, if we hadn't cut interest rates, uh, 
think about where the currency would be. I think it would be substan perhaps substantially higher and that would be bad for both in, you know, um, uh, achieving the inflation target and for um, lowering unemployment. And the fact that interest rates are lower has put more money in the hands of people and gradually that gets spent, maybe not as quickly as it used to be. But So those channels are still uh, are working and I'm confident in the end uh, we'll have more jobs and better income growth because of the cuts in interest rates. Uh, but as we move down further, I think the interest rate cuts are less effective. I'd agree with that. Uh, I wouldn't agree with the fact that there, there's no positive benefit. I think we'd still get um, some benefit and my board will have to judge whether that's appropriate in the circumstances we face. So. I don't, I don't think it's a constraint. It's, a, it's certainly a factor that it's um, influencing the labour market outcomes. And that, as I said uh, in response to an earlier question, I think the, the main challenge is to get wage growth up and have that consistent with the inflation target. So we've had uh, three years in a row of employment growth of 2.5%. That's pretty strong. The labour force is, or well, the population is only growing at 1.7%. Population is growing at 1.7, labour force growing at 2.5%. You would expect to get uh, substantial inroads into the unemployment rate, but over the three years, the unemployment rate's hardly moved anywhere. Because what's happening is we get more labour demand, you get more labour supply, so the participation rate is um, rising very strongly, and so it's proving quite hard to create a tight labour market, and so wage growth isn't picking up. And the other element that you referenced is underemployment. There's quite a lot of um, underemployment uh, and that's affecting wage dynamics. Uh, the underemployment though is really you know, part-time workers who want to work more hours. And the Bureau of Statistics asks uh, people when they do the labour force survey, uh, if you're a part-time worker, do you want to work more hours? And the vast bulk of part-time workers actually don't want to work more hours. They're quite happy working part-time and they're happy with their hours. But around 20% of the people who work part-time want more hours, and on average they want two days extra a week. So that acts as a kind of an extra pool of surplus labour. So we're finding kind of labour supply is very flexible, so labour supply is rising quickly, and of the people in the labour force, there are, there are a group of them who want more hours. So that's, that's the issue we face. How, how do you create a tight labour market, when, particularly when supply is very flexible? And uh, you know, my board discusses that a lot. Well, I think we'll, we'll finish up there. On behalf of the um, audience and also on behalf of the ANU, um, I want to thank uh, Dr Lowe for uh, a very stimulating um, lecture and for um, uh, readily agreeing to uh, answer uh, questions um, and um, so many questions of that. Um, I want to thank uh, Professor Martin Richardson. Uh, thanks, Martin, for the work you've done organising uh, this lecture, and also uh, Michelle Burke, too. Thanks, Michelle. Just reminding you that uh, refreshments um, are available outside, out in the foyer there. So, again, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I, I nearly forgot, there's a, a packet of ANU souvenirs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.